Good morning. Uh, hi, my name is Indy Johar. I am uh, firstly apologize for not being there in person. Hopefully by the time you're hearing this, I'm actually en route uh, in the air. My flight unfortunately got cancelled. So um, yes, uh, that's my first apology. However, um, I'm super delighted we're all here. I think this is a very important conversation and has multiple structural ramifications. We often talk about the institutional crisis of the 21st century. And I would argue that the institutional crisis of the 21st century that we're facing is a one in a 400 year crisis, a crisis of, of a deep transition of how we relate to the world. And in how we relate to the world, property is probably the number one issue of how we've organized the world around us and how we make this transformation into living in an entangled complex world requires us to reimagine our relationship with property. And I suppose the main reason for this conference and all of us to come together or unconference is to actually start to think about this question because I suspect it is the structural question of our, of our generation. And, we'll, and it's a structural question that's open to radical reimagination in a way that no other, no other question was or is. So it's under that sort of guise that I sort of uh, start this conversation. I'm going to go through a few slides, hopefully to share some of the kind of context. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Alex, Jane, uh, and a few others are here. So I really look forward to all of us meeting as well. And I really thank Margaret and Matt for being patient uh, with, uh, with me being on screen. Thank you, friends. So in terms of starting this conversation, what I'd like to do is, is talk a little bit about ownership. Everyone talks about ownership, but really let's talk about it properly. So data, which we often talk about, data ownership, privacy, well, it's 3.2 trillion worth of total value right now. Global real estate is 325 trillion of value. We're talking about, and businesses are about 109, as you can see, in the ownership of businesses. We often talk about ownership, but we don't actually know the scale of it. And one of the things I would argue that ownership and a theory of property has been the fundamental means of organizing the world, certainly for the last 400 years. And it's been kind of one of the structural tools we've created to be able to do what we've done. Now, in that process, there's been multiple, multiple, multiple you know, the, the construction of that world was based on the disposition of an old world. The construction of that world was, um, on one hand, also created a new form of liberation for people living under the tyrannies of kings and queen, queens. It created new theories of sovereignty in a way that was not possible before. The construction of that world has created all sorts of other divisibilities that at that moment in time look sufficient, but actually over time look problematic. So property is a contested issue, and it has historically um, given us both, it's been built on vast dispossessions, and no doubt that we must recognize, and also be part of a, uh, of a new form of actual liberation simultaneously. Um, and it's also been, kind of a means uh, where we've seen vast amounts of common goods have been privatized. So collective wealth has been privatized. A modern day example is the High Line. We did the work on this where, you know, uh, the High Line cost, whatever, 187 million to build, to construct, generated in order of 3.48 billion of land value uplift, right? So this value that was constructed by a common good was entirely privatized. And effectively, the additional tax revenue was marginal. So what we've seen is common goods increasingly being enclosed. And you could argue, you know, if you took your house and um, anywhere in California and put it into the middle of, I don't know, uh, middle of northern Siberia, how much is your house worth? Not very much, because the value of the house comes from its monopolistic access to labor markets, quality of life, uh, schools, all these other things. So actually, the private house is a it is largely a function of its location, location, location. It's, it's access to intangible goods. Yet we often deem it as dif, uh, as discrete, divisible value when it's actually entangled value function. So in the challenge of kind of property, I think it's really 
critical to sort of look at the paradigm shifts that are causing us the crisis. The objectification of land, the divisibility of land, which seemed okay, actually no longer is sufficient, whether it's for pollinators, whether it's actually divisibility in terms of time, so soil set, soil, uh, uh, soil quality degradation, or whether it's actually in terms of objectification of uh, not seeing the entangled value of, of that piece of uh, location. The extractive, the rights orientation, the extraction of um, property rights, not property responsibilities, the ability to have asymmetric rights has constructed a worldview which has allowed for systemic negative externalities in many, many formats. And the ability to abstract and centralize those rights has actually allowed for the further disembodiment of those rights from the embodied entanglements that would have existed with property was actually a relational framework. And our theory of managing it, which has been through a theory of control and regulation, isn't able to manage the complexity, isn't able to manage whether you're talking about a piece of land in terms of soil quality, microbiome quality, carbon sequestration, um, water quality, nutrient quality, all these things which are situationally appropriate. We do not have the regulatory pathway to manage that situational appropriateness. And that crisis and that's an information, total information crisis, means our theory of governance of property rights as a means of orchestration no longer works. And at the core of this, we've got, we have a systemic crisis. And that crisis is manifesting itself as many forms. And, you know, um, and one of the ones I would talk about when the many listed here is the crisis of entanglement. Right now in the streets of Netherlands and Holland, you're seeing people on the streets, farmers on the streets, because there's a nitrogen crisis, nitrogen pollution crisis, which is how much nitrogen, can, nitrogen pollution can you produce as a housing industry versus the farming industry? And there's a total cap. So as constraints come into the landscape, the divisible infinite rights become actually no longer viable. So we have to start to live in entanglement. The forcing function of entanglement is actually starting to challenge our theory of divisible property rights as we perceived it as we start to have to reimagine and relive into our entanglement. And this is manifest in carbon, embodied carbon budgets and other things. And this is just the beginning of the story. And that entanglement can be future facing, biodiversity facing and other things. So how we operate into the entanglement, and I think the entanglement is increasing, whether it's you know a sea level rise and displacements, how do we operate into this new entanglement is actually fundamentally one of the systemic challenges that's starting to challenge our theory of divisible property. And it's also challenging our theory of single point optimization, how we optimize the world for a single point of view, a single point of ownership, when actually we have multiple points of view, multiple points of entangled value. And we do not yet know how to operationalize governance in a way that doesn't optimize for single points of view. And that I think is a systemic challenge of operating in entanglements. And that requires us to be more forms of embodied agentified um, relational um, ways of being as opposed to abstracted ownership, asymmetric rights of being. And this is a nuanced but critical th theory. And it means we move from an asymmetrical power structure to a relational power structure. And if you notice, I've got cars there, I've got buildings there, because what we're doing is challenging our theory of how we relate to the world in a radically agentified way. And this, this world has already been happening. And it, in history, it was already there, as many indigenous and first nations will rightly say. And as we start to move towards that, what does that mean? As we start to decenter the divisible worldview or the human centric worldview into actually a relational worldview. And what does it mean to even our theory of how we, how we make the things that we need? I found this incredibly beautiful, right? So how do we start to operationalize ourselves into a worldview where we are borrowing matter from the world, we're seeking permission, recognizing that this, this matter is actually part of an infinite chain of value. And this is a deep structural transformation of who we are and how we behave in the world. And the invitation for that is vital. And it can be beautiful as well. What is the embassy for the North Sea? What's the embassy for the Atlantic? How do we start to live in a deeply relational world? What if a forest becomes self-sovereign? What if a building becomes self-sovereign? Or what if a camera becomes self-sovereign? Because in the act of self-sovereignty, you also introduce the theory of care and embodiment and relationality, as opposed to abstraction, extraction, um, and, and control. 
And so part of what we've been doing is building up these experiments. And you'll see many of my colleagues have been building on whether it's land which owns itself or a house which owns itself, or whether it's or, or whether it's a camera which owns itself. And these are parts of a whole plethora of experiments that we're working, some in Scotland, some all across Turtle Island. And some of these are looking at self-sovereignty, but some are looking at partial self partial self-sovereignties. And how do you operationalize in this in this worldview? But it's also worth recognizing the dominant power of this transition that we face isn't necessarily going to come because we've done some nice experiments. Almost certainly, the dominant theory, the dominant transition price is going to be through crisis. And the crisis, and as crises have done, will shatter Overton windows of the acceptable to construct radical new Overton windows. How do we build housing affordance when actually, if you were to true cost a house in the 21st century, it's perhaps three to five times its current cost? How do you build housing affordance when actually our body carbon constraints are so, so limiting that we don't actually have the, we are able to build the housing supply to match the, the current demand as we perceive it? So these forms of crisis as they manifest require us to radically reimagine futures. And these crises open up the possibility for different alternatives. And in that moment in time, experiments that have been built and are part of the story are critical to be able to drive this future. And so what we've been doing is mapping some of these strategic crises that we see um, and risks that we see on the table. And there's a digital map, which is looking at some of these, whether it's housing crises or whether it's wetland, uh, ecological um, breakdowns, many of these crises require us to systemically reform our theory of property. And this is where we think the future will be built first. And it's also critical to look at this context through the theory of how we actually organize property is linked to our theory of finance. How do we reimagine financing, which isn't linked to a theory of property and ownership? How do we reimagine finance in a way that isn't colonizing and controlling, but actually is, different, is a radically different future? How do we govern in a mass multi-stakeholder way? How do we build the political capital for this form of conversation? How do we design with the structural lock-ins in mind and the historic injustices in mind in that framework? These are some of the questions for us, and I'm really excited we're all here. And I thank you for, for spending the time with us and being here.